Good morning, learning community. Happy Labor Day. My name is Sally Ponce. I'm a financial aid counselor here at Goshen College. I also am a part of the learning community as an instructor for Section 5. <laughs> Today I have the pleasure of introducing Joel Pontius. He is the speaker for today's plenary. Joel is an assistant professor of sustainability and environmental education based at Mary Lee, where he directs the sustainability sustainability leadership semester and the sustainability studies major. With a background in wilderness guide, he has worked in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem in and around Grand Teton and the Yellow National, Yellowstone National Parks, the mountains and sage root steppe of southeastern Wyoming and along the Colorado Front Range. He's also a writer and storyteller much of his writing deals with foraging, fishing, hunting, and the local food movement. He has written for such magazines as Wyoming Wildlife, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation Bugle Magazine, Edible Michiana, and in academic journals. His first book will be released this winter. Please give a warm Goshen College welcome to Joel Pontius. Thanks, Sally. Good morning, everyone. I am so excited to be here uh, to talk about a few of my favorite things, um, rivers, fly fishing, and great writing. Who's excited for those things? Everyone. All right. So um, since it's Monday morning, I thought we'd start off kind of slowly um, to do a little breathing exercise. So everybody. Sit up, uh, maybe put your, um, get to a place where you can sit up straight and um, put your feet straight on the floor. And um, while we're breathing, I'd just like for you to take a look um, at this image behind me. So take your hands and put them on your belly. And then you can start kind of deeply breathing as you look at the image. Um, and breathe into your hands, fill up your belly, and then your chest. So breathe deeply, but not labored, and just fill your belly and fill your chest with air. So as you see this image, this is an image of um, one of my favorite watersheds. But also consider that the shape of these rivers is very similar to um, the shape of our veins and our arteries. So as you're looking at the image, you are seeing with retinas that are lined with the same patterns and the same shapes delivering blood. As you look down at your hands, you can see the blood vessels that are shaped um, also similarly. The veins that spread out in our lungs um, look exactly like a watershed the ones that run from your heart, circulating the blood and water through your body. There's something that's very unique about rivers, um, especially in a spiritual sense. Religious traditions worldwide kind of start and end with rivers. If you consider even the, the biblical narrative, it starts with a river in the headwaters at the top of a watershed, and it ends with a river. So I know that um, you're about to read A River Runs Through It, or have already read it. And I wanted to start out with this kind of famous quote. In our family, there was no clear line between religion and fly fishing. We lived at the junction of great trout rivers in western Montana, and our father was a Presbyterian minister and a fly fisherman who tied his own flies and taught others. 
So what I'd like for you to do is just group up with somebody next to you and fill in the blank. So fill in the blank for your own family background. There's no clear line between religion and um, what activities hold spiritual significance like this in your family. Um, you might replace the word religion with something else if that's not quite your jam. So go ahead. All right, take about 30 seconds and finish up your conversation. That wasn't 30 seconds. That was three seconds. Um, so, so go ahead and share some of them out to the bigger group. What are some of those things? There's no clear line between religion and food. So um, what about food? Uh, family meals and stuff like that. Okay, so sharing meals as a family. Uh, did your family cook together? Kind of, okay, so it was more of like a, when it's meal time, you know, we do that together. Very nice. A few others. Go ahead. Disney. Disney. Like Disney. Disney. Okay, so what were some favorites of the Disney brand? Finding Nemo, Dory, great. So um, your family like watched a lot of Disney movies. Did you ever go to Disneyland or Disney World? Was that part of it too? Okay, there's still time. Awesome. Some other examples. Painting? Oh, great, as a family. No kidding. So a family of artists, creatives, and did you have like a studio set up? Wow. So intergenerational. Let's see, uh, there's a lot of connection between fly fishing and painting, kind of the artistic thing. Great. All right, one more. Don't be shy. Math. What was that? Math. Math. A love of numbers. Well, yeah. My dad's an economist, and my brother's an engineer, and my mom tries to keep up. <laughs> so we, we, we talk about like math stuff. Yeah. You talk about math stuff. And um, does your mother have <laughs> something she likes about math as well, or like a yeah, piece of it she enjoys? Really Interesting. So um, talking about math as a way of bonding, as a way of understanding the world. Maybe one more. These are great. Football. Football. 
All right, so say some more about that. No clear line between religion and football. Beautiful. And, um, like, is there a team, of course? Oh, IU. IU? IU on Saturday. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and then you're going to, yeah, Indianapolis Colts on Sunday, so a double. Nice. I tend to be more of a Fairweather fan, like, whoever's winning, it's really exciting to be like, winning! Yeah. I'm also, I went to IU, so I have a lot of respect for people who continue to be IU fans. <laughs> so um, for me, there was no clear line between religion and time spent outside. Um, they might be the same thing uh, at, at different times in my life. But when I was 23, I was straight out of undergrad, and I moved to this place. Um, you might recognize the photo. It's a famous photo by Ansel Adams. And this is a photo of the Grand Tetons um, overlooking the Snake River that runs through the valley there. So when I moved to this place, um, it was a new beginning for me. Um, I grew up primarily in Indiana, um, but I was also the son of missionary um, folk. So we lived in Jamaica, Guatemala, some other places, um, but mostly the heartland. And to me, as a 23-year-old, um, this place represented a whole lot of potential, a lot of potential growth, um, a lot of uh, potential questions, and a lot of potential things that I could start doing that I'd always wanted to do. And one of those things was fly fishing. So um, in this novella, um, you'll see that, um, that the author talks very intimately about different kinds of rivers, different names of rivers, different, um, you know, different characteristics. How do the trout live in them? Um, how do the rivers move? What are the substrates? They're all extremely different. This one um, is a very special river to me. It's called the Grovant River. Um, its headwaters are in the Grovant Mountains that are to the east side of Jackson Hole. And um, this particular picture that I did not take um, is, is the river flowing past um, the Grovant landslide. So there's a giant landslide. Um, it's the second largest in the world that made a bunch of lakes, and it also made um, the character of this river. So um, I lived in this place called Kelly, Wyoming. I lived at one Ditch Creek Road, um, which I don't know how many more addresses there were on Ditch Creek Road, at the Teton Science School. It was in Grand Teton National Park. And what I would do is I would um, do a lot of educational work, um, teaching and learning as part of a program, and then I would get lost, and I would primarily go up the Grovant River. Um, for me, in this time of my life, I really needed a place where I could have solitude. So I would go alone, um, but surrounded also by lots of different critters. I remember once um, on the Grovant, I found this, I found this canyon, and I really loved it. So I kept going back there, and I kept going back there. And, you know, it would take a while. It took like, I mean, I was in my truck probably for an hour just to get to a trailhead, and then it was another, oh, I don't know, ways walking, maybe an hour. Who knows, mileage-wise. But I'd hike down into this, this canyon, and I was walking along the river um, to one of my favorite, it was just a favorite pocket of water. Um, there weren't a lot of trout in the river, um, but they were concentrated in certain little places. And I was along this kind of sandy bank, and I walked in, and I fished for a little bit, and then I started to get really uncomfortable. 
And I was, I was like looking around, and I couldn't like figure out what was going on because I wasn't used to being afraid. So, so I started walking back up this sandy bank, and about 100 yards into my walk, in my tracks were a set of mountain lion tracks. So the story means a lot more than I'll say. But it was, um, it was a place where I could be immersed um, in things that, that um, were spiritual and also um, very experiential. So one of the things that I love about fly fishing is that um, you, know, you have to follow all these waterways. Um, like, you know, like their veins, and they take you places, and they transport things. Um, so this is just uh, from, from Google Maps. It was the best I could do. Um, there was a time, so these are the Grand Tetons. Um, this is Phelps Lake. And there are all these little fingers of, you know, kind of smaller streams. And they don't have a lot of fish in them, but I really enjoyed exploring off of the trails. Um, so there was this, this day, I found this place on a map, and I was like, I want to go there. So I did that. And I started walking, and I walked upstream for a long ways, and, you know, did a lot of crawling over dead trees and downfall and all this stuff. And I finally get to this, um, this run that is just, I mean, it's everything that I wanted to see in this little stream. So I got out my rod and I, um, you know, worked on tying an elk hair caddis fly on and I was busy concentrating, you know, and this, this, um, this little place that I'm in is very loud, you know, it's just, it's beautiful. It's just got you. So <clears throat> there I am on this bend, and I'm just doing, um, I'm, just, I'm just looking at this river, and I'm, and I'm fishing. When all of a sudden, out of the kind of the corner of my eye, I catch a little bit of movement. And the movement that I caught was something that was very dark colored, and it was low to the ground, and I was like, Oh boy. So I'm standing there, you know, this deep in the river, in the middle, you know, the middle of this stream. It's actually hard to stand up. The water's moving so fast. And, and I start to look, and it's a black bear cub. And then it's another black bear cub. And they're like, you know, from me to Dwayne, um, they're just coming through this area. And, and I felt, I felt um, a, uh, a lot of adrenaline, but I stood there like this, like, oh boy. So then, on the other side of the stream, I see more movement, and I kind of look a little bit, but I don't want to move a lot, and the mother is working her way up the other side of the stream. So here I am, you know, someone who talks a lot about bears, has spent a little bit of time around bears, thinks, I, I think I know a lot about bears. And one thing that you definitely don't ever do is get between a mother bear and her sweet little cuddly tumblers, these little cubs. So for, I mean, I don't know how long it was, but for some moments, she is here, they are there, and I am here, like... So, and then the other funny thing is I have a knife, but it's in my pocket, and I'm wearing waders, which are like basically big, goofy, waterproof pants um, that you wear in really cold water. So, to get <laughs> the knife, I would have had to like undo my, um, you know, basically these big overall trouser things and pull them halfway down to get the knife. So what I did was just this. I mean, I was just standing there with my fly rod like, until the cubs finally crossed the stream just right above me and they kept going.
My father was very sure about certain matters pertaining to the universe. To him, all good things, trout as well as eternal salvation, come by grace, and grace comes by art, and art does not come easy. So fly fishing isn't necessarily an art, but it can be. Like a lot of things, like cooking, like, I don't know, can football be an art? Math can be an art. Football can be an art, right? The watching of football can certainly be an art. So I just wanted to show you some basics. Um, raise your hand if you've been fly fishing before. OK? Raise your hand if you've seen someone fly fish before. OK? And that's good, good information. Um, so this is my fly rod. Um, you could spend a ton of money on a fly rod if you wanted to. But you know what I did? I bought the one with the best warranty. Um, it's a decent fly rod. And I have gotten six new fly rods um, since I bought this back in, I don't know, it was a while ago, maybe 15 years ago. The last time I got a new one, you know, they make you send the whole rod, including the broken piece. So, you know, you stuff it in a tube, you FedEx it to them, um, and then they send you your whole rod back with the new piece that you broke, which is usually the end, but could be really. Well, I've actually broken the end mostly, and then every, every part but the base I've broken. So what they did last time is um, they sent me a whole brand new rod, every part of it, and I got a little note from whoever was saying it was like, well-loved or something like that. And honestly, I was kind of mad because I didn't want a new rod. I just wanted them to replace the, the piece that was broken. So um, a fly rod, the basic concept is that um, the rod itself is actually doing the work. So it's very long. It's flexible. Um, it's kind of like the same, the same kind of idea as an arrow um, shooting from a bow. But um, with a fly rod, it's the heavy line that's loading the rod and sending the fly. Um, I have, I just cut the hook, the barb off of this thing. This is a salmon fly representation called a sofa pillow. So you can see it. Um, so you've got this, this reel. Um, d depending on what kind of fish you're fishing for, the reel could be important or not. Most of the time, the reel is just a place to store the line, and then you do most of the work with your hands and the line. Um, but with, with large fish, like, um, I don't know if you've ever seen a tarpon or heard of a tarpon. They're very popular as a sport fish. And then you really need the reel um, to be able to fight the fish, because, you know, they could rip your hands off. <laughs> Big ones. So you've got the, um, you've got the fly line. Um, this is a floating fly line to, um, to keep the, the, the line on top of the water. And then um, from the fly line, there is a leader that is clear, and then some tippet, which is an extra um, small diameter kind of line. What else? So this is a, a picture of a dry fly. Um, in the book, you'll read about dry fly fishing um, as like a great thing. There are different ways to do fly fishing. Um, this is a dry fly. That means it floats on top of the water and usually um, represents some kind of species of insect that most of them live most of their life under the water as a nymph or as a, a macroinvertebrate, and then for their adult phase, which is usually short, they, um, they emerge out of the water and then they become flying insects to mate. And then they mate and die. And the trout eat a lot of them because um, you know, it's part of the life cycle that's, that's in the stream. This one's called an elk hair caddis fly. Um, the first uh, bull elk that I, that I ended up killing with my bow um, was a major part of our, our food there in Wyoming. Um, I tanned the hide because I knew that I was going to use it to, um, 
to tie flies. I should have brought it with me. Um, so the hide itself is like, you know, as big as this part of the stage. And still to this day, I think I've maybe used a square foot of it to tie like a thousand <laughs> elk hair caddis flies. It's really funny. But what are you going to do after you spend like a hundred hours tanning a hide? I'm not going to get rid of it. Uh, I was actually planning to use it as a blanket, and um, I, was, I was newly married, and my um, wife did not like that idea. <laughs> I've grown up a little bit since then. Um, there are lots of different ways to cast a fly rod. Um, there are lots of different kinds of casts. A very simple one um, is called a roll cast, which basically just uses the, um, the fly line to cast the little bug. You know, like if you're in a very small... Um, spot in a stream. You can continue doing that to cycle that back up the, up the way. Casting is interesting because as the art of fly fishing goes, um, people get really interested in the casting. But you can be a very... Um, I actually know some people who are excellent casters, and they, they don't know how to catch a fish because they're worried so much about their form. You know, and it's all about the casting form. But if you wanted to, um, you could probably catch more fish just tight lining, which means you don't cast at all. You just have some line, and you stand um, in a, like a bouldery place that has lots of pocket water where the trout are feeding, and you just stand there for long enough for the fish not to be scared of you or they don't even see you, and you literally follow the, the water like this. And then, you know, when a fish strikes, you, you hook it. And you don't have to worry about, you know, like if you have, if you have tons of line laid out all, all the time, the, um, the water, did I get you yet? Someone was a little bit concerned about me doing this, so I want to give them something to be concerned about. Um, <laughs> there we go. Oh. <laughs> Got your eraser. So um, it's really about mirroring what's happening in the river. Um, one of the things that's really interesting in this book is so you have this Presbyterian minister, and he has you know this there's this there's no line between religion and fly fishing, and it shows up in this metronome. So you've got this these people in a yard, and they're casting by the metronome, by the, the timing of a metronome, by this measured thing. And it's really interesting, because part of it is timing, but it's mostly feel. And what I think the author is doing is setting up this character, the Presbyterian minister, that has it all based on the metronome, when what you really need to do is get out in the river feel the water. To be a really good fly caster, you can feel the line, and you can feel the rod, and you can feel the wind, and you can understand that like all this water is moving at different speeds. All these different things are happening inside the river. All these things are happening um, outside the river, and it's really more about being a mirror to that and trying to show the fish what the river is doing at that moment. So here's a little bit about the anatomy of a, of a river. I use some of this language um, in the book. A rapid or a riffle, a run, glide, that's kind of that's nice. I haven't called anything on a river a glide. I'll try that sometime. In a pool. So, one of the things that I love about um, like river metaphors is that you know we tend to think of rivers or you know moving water as a linear thing, but it's not. So any river, anywhere, all the time, is flowing backwards, is flowing forwards. It's flowing um, in pretty much every direction. You can see on this diagram here, um, we have 
some language around an eddy. So that means that the water moves back around something and then it actually swirls backwards. You can find an eddy, um, like if you're crossing the little bridge by Shanklin Park. Um, anytime there's a bridge structure um, that has you know, pylons that are interrupting the flow of water on the back side of the pylon, on the downstream side, you find an eddy. There's a place where the, the water is actually circling backwards. And then this is showing a little bit more about, um, you know, like what you can expect, especially in a trout stream that has a little bit more elevation change than um, a river like, like the Elkhart, for example. Actually, next Friday, I'm about to um, set off on, oh, this, this Friday, my gosh, this Friday, I'm about to set out on a canoe trip from, um, essentially from Mary Lee, um, at the top of the watershed, and then we'll paddle all the way to Lake Michigan with the sustainability leadership semester. Um, and there are riffles, there are eddies, there are tailouts, there are pools, but you know, in a lot of the mountain environments, you've got the headwaters are up here, the snow is melting, and then they're flowing down these mountains, and you've got this you know, major elevation change that makes a lot of different kinds of river, ha river habitat and a lot of oxygen in the water. Here, we have more of a slow thing going on. Um, very little elevation change. The water is moving in ways that are a little bit more nuanced. But then, t technically, all this stuff is, is happening still. One of the things that I um, like about fly fishing um, is that it helps you to perceive um, kind of the whole picture of a river system. And one of the places that we really look into, um, especially for species of trout, is um, these areas called seams. So, you know, you've got all these competing currents, they're going everywhere. And where the different currents are coming together, it makes this kind of special tension where a lot of food gets into these seams. Um, and it's swimmable. So where water is moving together, you know, typically it's actually slowing itself down a little bit. And um, so they can eat there and they can, um, they can be there. So I remember um, this, this image actually brings a story to mind. I was in um, a canyon. Um, in the North Laramie Mountains. And, you know, it's like, it's, it's a good while to get there. I think it's 10 miles walking, a couple thousand feet down, which means a couple thousand feet up. Um, there, was a, there was a big fire there um, maybe, maybe 20 years ago. So, like, most of the elevation is treeless. So I've definitely done some, some running away from thunderstorms, in thunderstorms. Um, hail, storms, really just beating the snot out of you. It's really good feedback um, to know that the whole, like, the whole man versus wild thing, silliness. We lose. We die too. Hail can be fun after the fact, like later, a week later. Fun to relive those stories. So I was in this um, canyon, um, and there's a, there's a, well, let's see. There's a run um, that's going into this big, deep pool. Um, it's beautiful. There's a, there's a cliff face, almost like that, that concrete wall there. Um, but it's 10 times as high. And the cliff face meets the pool. And then the river is running um, down into this pool. And there was a there was a fish, a very large, um, what I thought was a large rainbow trout, um, that was feeding. And they were doing it rhythmically. And they were in a place just like this, kind of between a couple rocks. Um, but it was a ways to get a fly to them. So I stood there watching for a while. And kind of seeing, like, well, what, 
what is that fish eating? And what they were eating is they were eating a, a little grasshopper. There are a bunch of grasshoppers in this canyon. Um, and I had actually um, learned about this grasshopper because I was interested in those fish. And I had made up my own original um, grasshopper pattern, made mostly out of elk hair, because I had a lot of that to work with. Um, <laughs> and um, it was made specifically with this time in mind, and everything was like, wow, this might work out, as long as I don't spook the fish. So it's very easy to find a fish that's feeding, and then accidentally cast wrong, or make a sound, or um, have the fly drag across the top of the water in a way that's not natural. And, you know, like trout are not the most resilient fish. I mean, if you look at them wrong, they'll, they'll flip over and die, honestly. Um, they need, they're like high maintenance fish, people. I mean, high maintenance. Um, they need highly oxygenated water. Um, they need all this stuff. And, and so there's that. But this fish was feeding, and, um, I was kind of like, I was like, all right, I think I, think I can do this. So I finally did um, you know, go to cast. And my, my strategy was actually to bounce the, the fly <laughs> off the side of the rock um, so that it wouldn't, because there's only a little bit of, of um, space. And if I splashed the fly line too close to the fish, it was going to you know, not feed. So it, it kind of worked. Um, I bounced the fly off. It didn't go in exactly the spot I wanted. I wanted it to be like six inches farther um, into, the, into the pattern of this fish feeding to basically hit it in the nose. But the fish took it. So the fish went out of its line and ate the fly. So they kind of came up quickly, or it came up slowly. And then I hooked the fish. So the way that you hook a fish with a fly rod, um, it's not like uh, if you've ever gone fishing and you have to like set the hook. You don't do that with a fly rod. Um, the flies are pretty small. What you do is you basically, oh, gotcha. You basically just like take line and put your arm up in the air. See what happened? Um, and, and it just kind of, I won't hit you on purpose. Um, so, so the fish eats the fly. And you have to try to wait a second, even though it's not like instinctually. You just want to be like, wah! <laughs> but um, so, so I set the hook. And the fish is actually a lot bigger than I thought um, he was. It ended up being a male rainbow. And I, you know, so I, I hook the fish, and he's kind of holding down. And then this fish just takes off upstream, just goes flying. And, you know, like the, the, the line is running off of my reel, just like, bzz. I'm giggling like a little boy, like, <laughs> oh, like a little boy dolphin. And this fish just goes flying upstream. And I'm like, whoa, I thought he'd go downstream. So then... That's what he did. Um, so, you know, I'm like half of my fly line's out. And then this fish comes careening back down the stream, right? It's like he's done this before. So then what you have to do is you have to keep the tension on the fish. So I'm completely burning my fingers off, you know, like trying to keep, <laughs> trying to keep the line tense with the fish. And then he goes downstream um, the same way and then starts taking line. So I'm like running downstream, um, and I actually had to. I actually had to go downstream to meet him, and I was like, "All right, I think he's done." And then he takes off upstream again, and we do this several more times. I'm dolphin laughing probably the whole time, ah! because it's amazing. I mean, you just got this energy. So this is the moment that I remember. So you remember these rocks here? So I'm like running up the stream, uh, running up this pool. I'm trying to keep up with this fish. And I get to the head of this pool, and I'm like, there's no way that he can make another run um, up, this, up this area. So he, you know, like, I, I got ahead of him, 
and he went downstream, and then he came back upstream again, and um, he started to speed up, and I was like, whoa, he's gonna run into that boulder. And what happened is he came up, and he actually jumped right here, and he jumped all the way over the top of this boulder. And I just remember the line, and I remember like looking down it um, and seeing this fish and like following this fish. Um, and it was just one of those moments. I caught the fish, yeah. <laughs> and really after all that energy, like uh, I, I did a lot of catch and release which I don't really know what I think about that all the time. Um, but he had expended so much energy on this really incredible um, fight that I was like, I don't know. I mean, he's probably going to die from that. So, so we ate him. <laughs> and it was delicious. And I remember that too. So this is a short story. Um, this is Jenny Lake um, at the base of the Tetons. And I had some very interesting friends. Um, I have a high capacity for weirdness. And um, these, <laughs> these guys, I met them kind of randomly. And one of them was a fly fishing guide. And he was like, hey, um, he texted me one night. He's like, hey, we're going out for lake trout. And I was like, hey, well, it's 10. What, what do you mean? And he's like, I've got some. <laughs> I've got some glow-in-the-dark um, streamers. They look like minnows. And lake trout are a big problem ecologically in this place. Um, so they are non-native, and they've displaced a lot of the cutthroat populations that feed um, basically the entire ecosystem. So yeah, I remember um, in the middle of the night uh, being out you know, so sort of uh, waist deep in Jenny Lake and um, you know, the lake trout are a much larger species of fish than like a rainbow or a, um, a brown or a cutthroat trout. So I had this, <laughs> my friend Rob, he was like, hey, bring a big, like bring something big that you can carry fish home. So basically there's no limit on these fish and they're an invasive species. Um, so these are all like, the, the conditions were perfect. So I remember, you know, most of these lake trout are like, you know, they are, they are large, large and in charge. And we just filled. I had this big um, dry bag, and um, we got about a winter's worth of trout in one night. They were all up spawning. Um, and I remember, so part of the way that they um, do the spawn is they spawn with the full moon. So we were out there, and I mean, there, we basically, like you can see your shadow. It was so bright. Um, and yeah, it's just another place that fly fishing is taken. So I want to go back to this um, image of rivers. And I want to kind of leave you with a question. Um, the question is, what role do rivers play um, in this great story? What, um, what, does, the, what, what does the river... What do the rivers symbolize? Um, what space do they create um, for the story to take place, for the story to be rooted? Um, and yeah, just to also leave you, leave you with this image, um, because we have such incredible similarity with rivers. Um, and they literally, um, we have the same shapes running through us all the time. Thanks, everyone. So feel free to get in touch. Um, that's my Instagram and my email. Thanks so much, Joel. I, I hope you have a chance to, uh, to get to Mary Lee again, maybe take a course, maybe be there for a semester. And who knows, maybe I have a chance to go fly fishing with Joel someday. I'm going to invite Manoj to join us. Um, we've got a 
short video that he's going to tell you about and share with you in the next minute. Manoj. Hello, everybody. My name is Manoj Sapkara. I'm from Nepal, uh, the only country that is in Triangle of Sape because we're cooler than the rest of the world. trailer the full video will be uh, showing in chapel and in social media pages like Facebook and YouTube that's it thanks you're free to go and if you want to stop by and say hi to Joel he's still right over here thanks <laughs> 